Desalination technologies are an essential component in improving lives and helping societies develop. Development in these technologies will help us securing our future for generations to come. Hello everyone, my name is Yusuf al Khalifi and welcome to this presentation about my undergraduate research work in improving the performance of a mechanical vapor compression desalination system using a water-injected twin screw compressor. In this video, I will show the original design of the desalination system, and then I will talk to you about the advantages and disadvantages of the current system architecture, followed by proposing our new idea of using liquid injection. Then, I will present the simulation results and talk to you about how our current work fits into the larger picture of using water injection to improve these systems' performance. Finally, I will summarize the findings in the conclusion. The Mechanical Vapor Compression Desalination System, or MVC for short, shown here on the right, offers several advantages over other thermal desalination processes as listed here. First, let us look at the design of a typical MVC desalination plant and explain how it works. The first step in this process is to pump the feed seawater to the spraying headers located here. Inside this heat exchanger, which is called a horizontal tube falling film evaporator, the sprayed seawater forms a falling film that trickles down this tube bundle, absorbing thermal energy and partially vaporizing as a result. The formed vapor rises, passing through the mesh and out of the evaporator. On the other hand, the sprayed seawater that did not vaporize falls to the brine basin at the bottom of the evaporator to be discharged from the system. Next, the formed vapor enters the compressor to increase its thermal energy by compressing it, and it is directed then back to the tube side of the evaporator. Due to its higher thermal energy because of compression, the compressed vapor will release its heat back to the sprayed water falling outside, vaporizing it and causing the cycle to continue. Consequently, the compressed vapor will condense and it is subsequently collected for post-processing and usage. To improve energy recovery, preheaters are installed for the distillate and brine to add thermal energy to the incoming feed streams, thereby improving performance. For your reference, this is the mathematical model used to simulate the system based on mass and energy conservation principles. From the original system architecture, several drawbacks are noted. First, a high compressor discharge temperature is always present, which is characteristic of water vapor compression. The reason behind this can be understood from the following adiabatic compression relation. Since water has a relatively high specific heat capacity ratio, and the compression process is known for having a high pressure ratio, we can see that the outlet temperature will be extremely high. As a result, superheating of the compressed vapor will occur, leading to the non-uniform temperature distribution and heating across the tube bundle as can be seen in this temperature profile figure. As a result, a higher risk of scaling and fouling of the heat exchanger is inevitable. This scaling is due to the presence of calcium sulfide in the seawater, which has an inverse solubility relation with rising temperature, meaning that as the temperature of seawater rises, more calcium sulfide will deposit on the heat exchanger walls, leading to poor heat exchanger performance and increases maintenance costs. All of these consequences related to the high discharge temperature limit the saturated temperature rise in the compressor to between 2 to 5 degrees Celsius, therefore reducing the mean temperature difference in the falling film evaporator and increasing its size. Therefore, resolving the high discharge temperature issue of the compressor will create a cascade of improvements leading to efficient operation and design. But first, we need to understand the physics of the compression process for effective concept development to address the high discharge temperature issue. The figure here shows the temperature entropy diagram of water to demonstrate the possible compression processes that can be done given a compression range. Compressing water in this compression range using a single stage isentropic compression process creates an excessive discharge temperature which is so large that it cannot be fitted in this figure. Another possibility is to multi-stage the compression process, which significantly reduces the discharge temperature. Increasing the compression stages to a huge number results in the most efficient process by approximating an isothermal compression process. However, due to the large number of stages involved, the solution is not economically feasible. 
Therefore, a wet compression process is the most economically feasible solution that doesn't require multiple stages while effectively eliminating the superheated vapor at the outlet, thereby reducing the discharge temperature and improving the performance of the system. Therefore, we will choose a wet compression process for our improved concept. So what is the best compressor type to perform liquid injection for a wet compression process? Should we use a multi-stage centrifugal compressor? Or should we use a single-stage twin-screw compressor? It turns out that the twin-screw compressors offer several advantages over a multi-stage centrifugal compressors. It has a higher compression ratio, eliminating the need for multi-stage compression. It has a higher isentropic efficiency due to injection. It has a lower operational cost because the compressor is directly coupled to the motor due to its low speed. And it has lower manufacturing and maintenance costs compared to a multi-stage centrifugal compressor. As a result, a single-stage water-injected twin-screw compressor is chosen in this study to improve the performance of the system and perform a wet compression process. We can see our original system here, where we incorporated a water injection line extracted from the desalinated water stream to be injected into the compressor at an intermediate pressure. The intermediate injection pressure can be adjusted between the inlet and outlet values. The injection process is modeled as a two-stage compression process with intercooling at an intermediate pressure. However, if the injection is to be done at the inlet pressure, it means we have a single stage compression with a two phase inlet vapor. For other injection pressure values, the process is a two stage compression with intercooling. And now let us look at the simulation and improvement results. It was found that the water injection pressure and temperature lift across the compressor affect both the specific power consumption of the compressor and the mass fraction of injected water. The specific power consumption and the mass fraction of injected water are both defined as the power consumption of the compressor and the injection water amount divided by the desalinated water amount. It can be seen that as the injection pressure and temperature lift increase, both the mass fraction of injected water and the specific power consumption increase. The reduction in the specific power consumption can be as high as 7.3%, which is significant. Also, it turns out that injecting water at the inlet pressure of the compressor is the best choice, as can be seen from the results. Overall, the mass fraction of injected water did not exceed 10% of the inlet to the compressor. Another important factor to look at is the salinity of the discharged brine. The brine salinity has a significant effect on the specific heat transfer area of the system. It can be seen that as the brine salinity increases, the total specific area increases as well, especially for very small temperature lifts between 4 to 6 degrees Celsius. On the other hand, controlling the brine boiling temperature TB between 75 and 105 degrees Celsius results in a minimum value for the specific heat transfer area for every brine boiling temperature. The minimum value occurs for brine salinities between 60,000 and 80,000 ppm. Another important factor is the seawater inlet temperature which affects the brine preheater specific area by increasing it as the seawater inlet temperature increases. However, the specific area decreases with rising temperature lift across the compressor, but increases with rising brine boiling temperature. These outcomes are the result of the changing mean temperature difference in the preheater affecting its size. Now let us look at the distillate preheater. Its specific area increases with seawater inlet temperature and brine boiling temperature, whereas it decreases with the rising temperature lift across the compressor. Similarly, these outcomes are the result of the changing mean temperature difference in the distillate preheater. Together with our work, significant advancements were made in developing special compressors that can deal with the requirements of compressing water vapor for applications in desalination and heat pumping. For instance, this work looked at the wet compression characteristics of a water-injected single-screw compressor in mechanical vapor recompression systems. 
This research tried to do both modeling and experimental study of a water-injected twin screw compressor and they found significant improvements in the performance, especially for high temperature lifts. On the other hand, this work looked at the performance characteristics of a water-injected centrifugal vapor compressor from a theoretical and experimental perspectives. Finally, this work looked into developing a water-injected twin screw compressor for application in a double-effect MVC desalination system and they found no improvements. To sum up, the proposed concept is effective in reducing the compressor discharge temperature, thereby improving the system performance across many levels. The reduction in the specific power consumption of the compressor can be as high as 7.3%, which is significant. Another finding is the presence of an optimum specific heat transfer area at brine salinities between 60,000 and 80,000 parts per million. Finally, it was found that the brine and distillate preheater areas increase with increasing seawater inlet temperature for all temperature lifts and brine boiling temperatures. The increase is sharper for lower temperature differences. To find out more about our work, please see the reference here. Thank you.